Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network Podcast. My guest today is my friend Barbara Hankins. I met her a little over a year ago, and we're part of a, a group that meets every Friday for really in-depth and sparkling conversation. And um, she is a she's an amazing woman, and I'm so proud and glad to have her on the podcast. Welcome, Barb's Babs, and um, I'm happy that you're here. Tell us a a bit about who you are and um, what's your what's on your mind today okay so what's on my well can I start with what's on my mind today sure um, <laughs> obviously in the UK we have a fallen government and um, I have to be I have to rein myself in every single day to uh, not get angry because yeah. I know that it's it's a it's a means to an end, and and there's going to be a different scenario coming up, not too far off. Having said that, uh, who am I? Well, um, I am. Uh, I've been known since the mid '90s as a catalyst for change. All right. Uh, so I am. I like to. Um, I, I'm well. I'm basically a servant leader. I was, if I start at the beginning where, give you a bit of background from um, who I am. Uh, born at, um, just before the end of the Second World War um, into a military family uh, with a World War I veteran uh, grandfather, seriously injured with a brain, hem uh, brain um, uh, injury that necessitated a metal plate being put in his head. He had four children before he went uh, to war and another six when he came back. So you can imagine the children's noise didn't go down very well. So it was very traumatic and for everybody, uh, the whole family. So my mum was the eldest of nine and um, I came along at the end of the World War Two, as I said. So um, that then meant that I was born into a small community of strong women because the men had been away to war. And we had a local vicar who um, ensured that um, uh, we were all sort of looked after um, spiritually. And he would uh, organize the women into teams so that two at a time went to sit with people um, who were near uh, near to death so that they didn't die alone and my mum was one of that team. So growing up um, I was up until the age of nine it was um, yeah it was difficult but I didn't know any difference so you know I was just okay and I've got a vision in my head of being about nine years old and sitting in a field that was sort of just down the road from where we lived and um, I remember just sitting there, I was on my own, and I was sort of dreaming about what life could be now that war had ended. And um, then all that came to an end because um, we, um, my mother died young uh, because of losing two, war, two children as well, two sons in World War II. And she um, died at the age of 59 before I was born. So my mom, she'd asked my mum to look after granddad, which we did. So we lived with him. And then uh, one day I had obviously done something wrong and I was I joined everybody else and I was beaten and was sitting in a window waiting for mum to come home from work. And um, there was a huge row and he literally threw us out into the street. So fortunately, a, a kind neighbour took us in for a while. Um, but then when it became um obvious that he wasn't going to change his mind um we had to leave and so we moved fast forward a bit um the impact on me in terms of ptsd was that i suffered from um brain freeze uh, particularly during education and particularly during my final exams so i came out of school with failure written across my forehead because I came out with one O level in bookkeeping, <laughs> which could have been a disaster, but actually it wasn't because I was lucky enough to be able to get my first job working for a law firm where a very nurturing woman 
took me under her wing and uh, took me on on the basis of my handwritten letter, so my handwriting, and of course my one O level, which was bookkeeping. She was the head of finance. And um, she nurtured me up all the way through the support side of the business until I ended up as common law clerk. So I started as office junior and then ended up as common law clerk with people working for me. And that was over a period of five and a half years. At the same time, in the meantime, my mum had remarried and um, we, uh, uh, my stepfather had been made redundant after 25 years working for a manufacturing company and he was and he closed down and he was made redundant and he never got a proper job again. So I then had to become the breadwinner for the family basically. And so I was doing this five day a week job and I was also doing um, six nights a week at a local cinema, um, just put bread on the table basically. Um, so that was very successful. You know, it was an absolutely wonderful opportunity that I had. And then my second career, corporate career, was um, working for a manufacturing company that had a pilot. Um, um, it was a pilot company that had bought the business from RCA in America. Thorn, it, this was Thorn EMI in America, in, in the UK, sorry. And um, they, they were growing uh, into a new purpose-built factory and they started off with 250 employees and in four and a half years we grew to uh, 1400 which was quite quite a growth spurt and obviously it meant that everybody had to pitch in and do whatever was necessary thankfully we had a Ghanaian um, personnel manager who believed in teamwork and he was absolutely fantastic because he made sure that we did our own jobs properly but that we also pitched in and helped to do just whatever was needed at whichever time. So we, we not only developed our own skills doing the job, our proper jobs, we also developed other skills. And uh, it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, at the end of four and a half years, I was um, coming to, um, um, well, I was pregnant, so I was coming to a career break. And I knew when I left that I would um, wanted to do this kind of work, but as a consultant when I returned to work, little knowing that it was going to be 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So it was it's really a case of, um, you know, how can I how could I um, um, how could in that position, how could I help other people? And, in, and really, the only people I could help was my own family because at that time we were going through enormous inflation and um, price rises and, you know, it was, it was just like it is now in the UK. So really, um, when I think about um, the work that I've done, um, having thought that I was a failure, uh, fast forward to when I got back to work, into work, um, I actually was able to, um, find a part-time job to fit around the children's school hours and I was driving around a network of garages in East Anglia selling car warranties at a pound a time so it was literally a, a job just to to pay the mortgage basically and <laughs> um, I then uh, I was there for about 18 months I think it was and um, then my boss came one day knocked on the door and asked for the keys to the car and told me that he was going to do it all by post so I'd lost my job huh. and it made me angry and all the all the childhood trauma came up um, and I thought and the, the strength of the emotion was huge. So I thought, well, I've got to do something with this because it's going to destroy me if I don't. So I took myself down to London to a company called Career Analysts, where I discovered that I've got problem solving and analytical skills within the top two percent in the country, which got me into Mensa where I found out that my IQ is 148. So I'd gone from being a failure to being, wow. So, well, I didn't even know what it, what it looked like. I didn't know. Amazing. So, sorry. Amazing. Well, yeah, it was, it was, it just changed my life because I was then able to walk into a job um, as a um, um, information officer and tourist information center manager for 
uh, the East Anglia tourist board. And um, they were impressed with what I'd, uh, well, the first job that they wanted doing was to reduce the postage bill, which was huge. When somebody wrote in for information about the area or where they were going to stay, the previous person had sent out the information for the whole region. So it was, the postage was huge. So that was my first job. And then I made a success of that. And they went on then and, and uh, they, I was in line for a three year plan to become an assist, associate director. Um, but in the meantime, I had the opportunity to go to Hong Kong with my then partner, who was going to run a factory out there for the car sheet. And um, I went out uh, with the best of references, hoping to work in the tourist industry, but was told that I wouldn't be able to do that because I couldn't speak Cantonese and it takes seven years to learn. <laughs> so I looked at my career, broke it down into skill sets and then went back to see him and said, this is what I believe I can offer the business community. Um, and he helped me build a network, introducing me to people. And I became um, um, a um, information consultant for the remainder of the two years I was there. Wow. And that, and I've been working for myself ever since. That's um, quite a story. And it's, I wonder if it's, a, it's almost an arch archetypal story of post-World War II British people in that there was the struggle to, to recover from the war yes. with a lot of trauma of of the soldiers who came home and the families that uh, had trauma visited upon them because of that and uh, as the as the political and the economic uh, struggles of the mid 20th century visited upon your country and upon you and your family that you, your life is sort of a a window into what what was taking place um, during those years, and, that, and that's really fascinating. I, I um, I'm grateful that you shared that because you know I don't I don't think I've ever heard you share that before. And no, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, no, not in our group. And um, and so. This provides a, a sort of a foundation for your perception of the world. Yes. And so how how is that perception now um, being expressed in the things that you do? What What is it that uh, is kind of occupying your focus and your time and your energies now? Well, let me say that what I brought forward from that, the one thing that I brought forward from that was my nan's Although she died before I was born, her wisdom came down through the family. Uh -huh. And it was, she was, what her, her mantra was to get her through the war and everything that she was experiencing um, was that um, always look for the silver lining. When things are really, really, really bad, always look for the silver lining because there's always one there. Uh -huh. and, 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 and I, I mean, there is different interpretations of that. For instance, if you look at a coin, if you flip the coin and see the other side, you will see a different perspective or even a Rubik's cube, turn it round, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And I use that very often when I'm trying to help people. <laughs> so um, I, I've brought that forward with me. And it was, I, I was, I, it was because also always to help other people. I mean, for instance, she would keep, pennies on the mantelpiece so that when a neighbor knocked and said I can't feed the children she would give them a few pennies it was only for the children not for the not for the adults they mm -hmm. had to look after themselves so I'd sort of carried this on throughout the whole of my life and built it into the way I work within businesses or one-to-one -one with people because I've been a coach I've been a mentor for the Princess Trust helping disadvantaged young people over a period of some 14 years or so. Um, I've worked within, I mean, the, the most inspirational um, change project that I did was working for a small manufacturing company that had an industrial relations crisis. And they had um, the shop, 85 shop floor 
staff go out on strike. And uh, they were entitled to go out on strike, but they threatened to withdraw safety cover from four furnaces that would have, if they'd gone down, would, would have wiped the company out because it would have cost too much to have refurbished them. So I was charged with um, employing these 85 people. And of course, I didn't get anybody with manufacturing experience. Mm -hmm. So I had to um, literally just interview people and find out what their transferable skills were, which I did, and it was very successful. But obviously, a big influx like that into a company that only employed about 200 and something people was quite a change for the whole culture and way the business was run mm -hmm. by this time they'd got obviously a new strategy we had a, we were working within a team again uh with um so they were increasing the exports and they were increasing the uh customer base and all that kind of thing was the new strategy so um the the influx of these new people obviously the people that were still there on the shop floor were quite irate, um, dissatisfied, because they felt that their needs hadn't been heard or listened to or acted on. And so part of the role that I played there was to um, harmonize, get the two working together. And it was very successful. And I was there for, again, four and a half years. And at the end of it, and, and, and the point was that the um, manufacturing director, or the managing director, sorry, had given me permission to do whatever was necessary. He said, I know finance, you know people, do whatever you need to do to get this business operating the way it should do. So I was, I was training supervisors, I was mentoring the um, production manager uh, who was newly in post. Um, and all, I, I mean, I don't know where it came from, but it was obviously from this previous experience that I'd had before I'd had children. And um, so at the end, when I left, because uh, I was only there part time as well, I was there initially doing uh, full time doing the recruitment, but then I was down to two days a week. And it was an amazing opportunity. And then at the end of it, I was accepted into the local university um, to do a master's degree in HRM. And I studied motivation for my dissertation. And um, because I couldn't find a global model to um, prove my theory on, um, I what's, had to, what's, what's yeah. your theory? What's your theory? My theory was that um, people are more capable than they think they are. Yeah. And that if they are intrinsically motivated, they will um, achieve, and, and and within the work setting, I'm talking about. If they're intrinsically motivated, they will they will do their all for the for the people in, for the for the business that they're working for, and um, that the motivation is is the best way of, or, you know, people. I hear managers talk about having to motivate people, but actually, you don't. You can't. There's nothing a manager can do to motivate people. The only way you can motivate people is to provide the culture and the environment in which they feel that they belong, that they're heard, their voices listened to, and that they are able to, to do the job that they're given to do to the best of their ability. How far, how far, how far back in time, when did this awareness or this um, perception of motiv motiv motivation come to your mind? When, when was that? Well, it came from, again, again, it came from childhood because I needed to understand my, my primary purpose in, in wanting to do this was to understand why people treat people the way they do. Yeah. Whether it be well or bad. You know, it, it, it reminds me of my reaction to the first um, set of materials that I read. The first books I read on leadership back in the mid '80s, and it was all about this this hero worshiping of the corporate CEO. Yes. And and I realized that that wasn't that wasn't what leadership was. You know that they're just superior managers because they they weren't the people that were having the effect on on people. 
personally. And like I was thinking about all the people that had had affected my life, you know, teachers and coaches and pastors and and grandparents and cousins and you know all these different people, my sisters, my mother and father, my grandparents, all these people who had had this indelible effect upon my life. That's that's what I saw as leadership, you know, and I and I came to see that all leadership begins with personal initiative to create impact. And it sounds to me that you have a similar view in that what you're you're seeking to do is provide an environment of self motivation where a person feels like, okay, I have, I have the, the wherewithal to take this initiative to make a difference here in my job. Is that, am I right about that? Abs no, you're absolutely on the ball. No, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, one of the things that I did in the manufacturing company was when um, I was taking these new people on and they were operating machines. Now, during the strike, before I was um, employed to get the new workforce in, all of the management team had to get down on the shop floor and operate those machines to keep the products coming out the other side. So oh, that was, <laughs> well, it was amazing because it gave, particularly the MD, it gave him the, the other side of the picture, the other side of the coin. He could see what a boring flipping job it was. So, so one of the things that I, I put in was to, when these people learned, learned the first job, that, that we then, in order to increase the flexibility, we m helped to train them on different machines. So they got a different viewpoint. They, they weren't just doing the same boring job every day. And so that was part of their development. And then as part of that, I was introducing um, learning um, uh, programs for them. Uh, and we were uh, started to identify what skills they were using and developing. And then I put that into what I call the flexibility report. And at the time, they were going through a quality initiative um, for the, for the uh, automotive industry. And that what they did was took that report and made it part of the official documentation because it showed how the people were being developed. Fascinating. Really, it's really fascinating. And... You know, it, it it reminds me of um, of a project that I did with a group with a team um, 23 years ago. I was just the facilitator on the team, and there were some other subject experts on the team who understood manufacturing systems. And we and we worked on a project with a um, a hosiery mill, a, you know, a, a a mill that made socks. Right. And they had been operating since 1940. And they hadn't changed their methodology in 60 years. Yeah, well, you understand this. And so they had 17 stations from the moment that the sock began to be created to when it left the factory. And each of those stations had a designated person, and they only knew that job. And, and so what it developed it into is that their job was to create inventory on all 17, in, in essence, there was inventory at every set, all, every station, and there was no workflow really, because mm. nobody, no one, none of the workers had any real, a real awareness of what the process was of making a pair of men's socks. All they yeah. knew was they're gonna, they're gonna do the sewing on the, on the toe, you know, to create the toe of the sock. I mean, that's what they, and they would do that every day, and they would do that for eight hours a day, and. At the end of the day, they'd have their their stack of now towed socks, towed socks over there at, at their station. And um, and what we found is that you know they they had a totally backwards understanding of what their purpose as a company was. Yeah, they saw it was we're we're going to manufacture socks when they really should have been thinking we're going to provide a service to uh department stores to provide them the socks that they need to sell to their customers you know it's yes it was a very it was my first time of working in a industrial environment and um it was really clear to me why so many companies have difficulty and then it made sense when you know i was reading the stuff about the the toyota system of um, manufacturing and how that 
that whole lean lean operation made sense. Uh, so you know it 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 fed that kind of curiosity I had. And so what you're what you're doing is feeding that same curiosity about how things how things work. So so what do you see if you look back over the last say twenty years or so? What what do you see happening in this is, a, is this environment that you have worked in? Well, strangely, over the last 20 years, because uh, life changed for me in 2002, because we moved from Essex to Worcestershire, which is where I now live. Oh, I see. And um, it was because of my husband's job, because he'd been turning a company around in Worcestershire for a year, and he'd done his job, and he went to the parent company and said, you know, uh, I've done the job. Do you want me to get somebody in for you? And they said, oh, no, we thought you might like to join us. It was one of those decisions that you wish you'd never made um, yeah. because within six months, they'd used it as a um, strategy to sell the division of which his company was one of four. And although they'd sort of offered them to, um, if they wanted to do a buyout, the, the MDs of the four of the four companies, whether they wanted to do a buyout. Two said yes, two said no. He was one of the ones who said yes. But then they used that to raise the value yeah. to the buyer, yeah. to the prospective buyer. So he came in, signed the contract, sacked everybody, closed all four companies down, sold the profits and made himself a fortune. Yeah, I've seen and, that. Uh, um, you know, it was absolutely dreadful. So that changed everything because it was a it was a big move that we'd made. And oh golly, what do we do now? So anyway, so we it was it was sort of a period of uh, revisiting strategy. What do we do? Where are we going? You know, we, <laughs> did we do the right thing? Yeah. Anyway, so at, at the end of it all, um, he actually used the experience of doing the business plan, getting the investors interested to help small businesses um, who wanted to do the same thing. And, and he created a business out of that. And I sort of um, wasn't, I haven't been able to, it, since I've been in Worcestershire, I haven't been able to get through the door of a manufacturing company, strangely. And I've no idea why. And I'm thinking it's part of the big plan that's up there somewhere that I was never meant to do that. I was meant to get it. You, uh, different experiences so hmm. the first one that I, I got was working for within the NHS for a um, um, they were they were becoming a foundation trust and there were four divisions within the old hospital they were building a new hospital on site uh, uh, on a separate site and they needed to recruit new people to become a foundation trust mm -hmm. and um, they uh, so so that a year later, uh, that what they'd done, they pulled the people who were doing the employment out of the divisions into a central recruitment center, and it wasn't working. And they wanted a review to know what had happened, which I did. And um, in the end, um, what they'd done was try to turn it into something like a typing pool where these experienced HR people were having to go to the manager to ask for the next task. And it was it was it was completely wrong. So I was able to change it around so that they all had roles. So is this something I mean, I, I don't know whether you can answer this. Is this something that would be uh, kind of a widespread practice there in the UK, this this kind of a approach to how you're utilizing your people? Uh, <laughs> well, unfortunately, in the NHS these days, the gap between the senior people and then, I mean, you know, we've got the NHS, which is the hospitals, but then there are about seven overarching businesses right. that all all feed from the same trough, as it were. And so the people making the decisions to do things have no understanding of what's happening on the shop floor with the patients. Yeah. And we've got consultants and even junior doctors now leaving 
before they've even finished their training because because they are just not being respected or or given any given any i mean the, the mp uh stephen barkley i think his name is um won't even speak to the unions i mean they've been on strike and they won't, he won't even speak to the unions to, to discuss a pay rise and yet these people in all of these organizations are earning huge amounts of money and so you know and <laughs> it's it's a disaster it really is a disaster so yeah you're absolutely right you know it's it's just it's just it's just crazy and of course what they're trying to do is to privatize it at the end of the day that's the ultimate aim yeah yeah i've seen how that works in hospitals and it's uh it's yeah. it's not no it doesn't always work out well no so um you're you're a little bit older than me and um but you're clearly not retiring i mean you're you're not a retired person you're very engaged in thought and in in um in the desire to do, to do work and and so so tell me tell me what it is that you as a person in your mid 70s would like to how you would like to spend your time because i think let me just frame it this way um you and i are in a in a in this in the in that place between the people who are at the end of their careers and the people who are deep into retirement but we're we're in this kind of space where we're we're not really ready to retire and we really still have things to do we really have talent and we have energy and we have um we have a, the opportunity to have an impact but the question is how how do we do that and where are the where what's the mechanism what's the structures for that to happen so t what do you think give me your well, thoughts i think i think it's probably different for me than it might be for an awful lot of other people i mean in the in the uh, village where i live there are a lot of older people it's it's a very it's one of those village old english it's, with black and white houses, you know, um, really old houses, Tudor houses. Oh yeah. And unfortunately, there, um, there are some lovely, lovely people here. I have to say, but you know, again, the mindset is not. I mean, for instance, there, there's been a recent um, objection to a plan to put solar farms. Now, I understand their argument in that they're saying. We, we don't want to use fields that can be used to grow food to uh, be taken over by um, solar panels. Right. And I can understand that. But there must also be an awful lot of lower rate land that isn't being used for, for food that could also be used. But there's a big fight going on. But anyway, the, in terms of the people, I, I some of the people that I, I speak to, yes, they're sort of, um, they're with it and they're on a, on a certain plane but I haven't really other than one person I haven't really found anybody else that uh, or one or two people who um, are like me and I, I mean I, I've learned so much in the last six years since I've lived um, away from where I used to live and um, I'm still learning and it, and it energizes me I know and I know and at the moment I'm working on a project because my grandson's been diagnosed with dys dyslexia. And so I'm now working on a project that, that looks at not only his experience, but what are the policies of the school? And it's a, it's a private academy and it's joining a, a larger uh, multi-academy. And um, looking at the way they treat the children and then looking at the local council and what their view is on the education part of it particularly for people with um you know um, um, a condition and then there's also a children's organization that is a branch of the of the uh, district council and what what is their viewpoint on this and then up to government level and what are the government policies and so I want because I want to do I when, when I did my motivation model when I did my masters it's about um 
uh, managers and employees answering the same questions, but uh, uh, answering the same questions, but obviously from a management point of view or from the employee's point of view. Mm -hmm. And then within that gap between the two, that's the place where I work or do the best work that I do because the managers don't understand because they've shunted in at the top. They don't understand what the employees do, but the, and the employees can't understand where the managers are coming from because they're saying it doesn't bear any real, realism to what we're doing every day. So essentially you're doing mediation work. I guess so. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you're, you're mediating between two different perspectives, two different layers of, a, of an organization and you're trying yeah. to, I'm assuming that what you're trying to do is create a level of understanding where the two two groups can actually work together and achieve goals Absolutely. for the people that they're they have been tasked to serve, which in this case would be children. Indeed, indeed. And so, you know, I want to be able to use the uh, structure of the motivation model to understand between what the government's doing and what you know. So, an overarching understanding of why we are where we are because apart from anything else one, one of the things i've learned very recently is that the people with dyslexia for instance are the skills the innate skills that they've got are actually so badly sought after like people like facebook and google all the tech big tech companies are going mad for their skills and there's and yet the education system is so far back in the 1970s, that they're not um, teaching them what they ought to be teaching them. And also, when you, are, when you have something like dyslexia, you are labelled. As soon as my grandson doesn't understand something and starts to get frustrated and fidgety and what have you, they give him what's called a C3, which is a bad behaviour point. And okay. they... Yeah, and, and they then add that to say, you are disrupting others' learning. But nobody's looking after him and his learning. Wow. Mm. So, well, you, know, it's, actually, you know, this is not unique to where you are. I mean, this is true in a lot of places. So it's... Um, yeah. And so... And, and then so we've what, got to change the language. We've got to, you know... The, because they're it's labeled as a disability yeah people don't like a disability and yet it's a condition that given the right what what uh, there's an organization called made by dyslexia which is a global i think it's the, um, um it's founded in the uh, in in the states uh -huh. and what what they what they're saying is um, actually, if they change the education system to accommodate their kind of learning for everybody, it would benefit everybody. So it would be joined together. Everybody would be learning the same on the same level. So you do away with the discrimination bit. You yeah. do away with the, um, you know, with the lack of inclusivity. Inclusi Inclusivity. Yes. Sorry, I, I stumble when I get excited yeah. about something. All right. I <laughs> we all do that. We all do that. So, <laughs> well, it's 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 interesting, you know, and I've heard you talk about this before, and you're very impassioned about your your uh, your grandson, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, and I, I don't blame you. And I think you know this is where parents and grandparents have to step up, and you know, and, and and make sure that the, the public is clear about the way uh, schools in particular are, are operating. And um, because you know, the, they're, the, they're, they're, they're impacting the future of the nation or the globe yes. in how they are educating their children. And uh, I mean, we, we experienced this when my oldest was, was uh, six. And he was uh, going in the first, he was first grade, he was in first grade and he had been reading for a year. He started, he started reading at five and we were living in, uh, in a small town um, in uh, West Virginia. 
And there were kids in his first grade class that didn't know shapes and colors. And you hear he's reading and they would, the teacher would give him assignment and he'd finish it in a minute, two minutes. And these other kids were, you know, taking 20 minutes or 30 minutes to do it. And they, he asked to be able to, to go read a book or something like that. And they wouldn't let him do anything because they didn't, they wanted to treat everyone equally, but they weren't treating everyone equally. And so the, what ended up happening is we ended up homeschooling him and, uh, and we ended up homeschooling his brother and sister as well. And, um, and that turned out to work for us um, because where we ended up living in North Carolina, there was a, there was a number of different homeschooling groups and we would, we connected with them and, they were offering classes that you know the parents, some individual parents would not have the the skills to teach, and so um, it turned out to be really uh, quite a good experience for us. But that's that's really not open to a lot of people, and um, no. I've you know I've had this conversation with some people in Africa, you know where you know the the big the big question every year is uh, where do our school fees where our kids come from? So they have to pay to go to school. And um, if they don't get those, then they have they have a very substandard uh, mm -hmm. program. And so what I found out is that in some places, then they are now homeschooling their children because huh? the system doesn't really accommodate them. And uh, so that, I think this is one of those uh, problematic things that is, is everywhere, um, but it's not the same everywhere it is. It's all... It's everywhere. It's very localized in, because the people who are running the schools and the people who are in the schools, the children that are in the schools and the families that are in the schools are all different and all have different ideas. And how, how a community works in those contexts is really one of, I think, one of the largest questions that we have today. And um, I think, you know, it's, it's not a simple thing at all but that's kind of where I see uh, some of the great challenges are that we're facing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it, it's quite worrying. I mean, I think a piece of research I was doing yesterday was um, looking at um, government policies. And I realized that in 2008, uh, there was a review done on dyslexia and um what they what they said was um oh no sorry it, at, at the time it was the department um the dscf uh, department of um children schools and families and when i did some put it into google it's no longer called that because since the Tories have been in, it's now called the Department for Education. So they've taken the humanity out of it. Interesting, interesting. And this, and, and I was absolutely astounded when I, when I, I mean, I knew, I'd heard of the D, DFE, obviously, Department for Education, but I hadn't uh, twigged that actually be, they changed it from what it was because, and that came about because George Osborne, in his wisdom, who was the chancellor um, early in um, um, you know, a number of years ago, um, put us all into a period of austerity. The reason being, he pulled, he, he closed down all the children's centres. Uh, you know, so everything that was done in the community, the money was sucked back into government so that they could spend it on what they wanted not what the country needed, but what they wanted, which well, was... Yeah, well, it just goes to show that every crisis is a local crisis and because of oh, yeah. local people in, in their lives and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, Babs, uh, I've enjoyed having you on here. Uh, you provided such a, a wonderful perspective on a slice of, of the world and a particular slice of the UK um, that most of us never have the opportunity to hear or to to be influenced by and so i i thank you for who you are and your your life experience and the way you, you have come to be able to articulate that because that's really it's really helpful 
I think, for people to understand what you've experienced and and to be able to do that in such with such in such clear ways is really quite valuable. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. So, so thank you for being on the on the show, and uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, soon. And everyone, thank you for watching. Um, hit the like button, subscribe. If you have a comment, please offer the comment because we'd love to interact with you. And uh, and I thank you for watching because this is always a very interesting conversation that we have here. And uh, this is another one that we've had. And I'm so grateful for having you on here, Babs. And so I'll see you soon. I'm, I, I'm rambling now. But I'll see you all next time here on the Eddie Network Podcast. Bye-bye.